Hello and welcome to the Carner Talks, where today I'm once again talking without a microphone and I apologise for any echo. All that being said, a microphone is on the way and the audio will be much better soon. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe because today we're going to be talking about the history of Jaguar and tomorrow we're going to be talking about the GM EV1, the world's first ever electric vehicle. So today is the entire history of Jaguar and uh, if you would prefer to read it in the description below you can see the Drive Tribe article but if you prefer to just sit back relax and watch a video then that's exactly why you're here and let's jump straight into that. Back in 1922, two young lads, William Walmsley and William Lyons, decided to set up their own little sidecar company. Walmsley was 30 years of age and uh, Lyons was just a little nipper in Blackpool of 20. And uh, the two of them decided to take a thousand pound overdraft from the local bank guaranteed by their respective fathers. And on the 4th of September, 1922, I, uh, coincidentally, Lyons' 21st birthday, the two of them set up the Swallow Sidecar Company and this would eventually go on to be Jaguar, but there's a lot of history before we get there. Using this thousand pounds, they employed their first ever employees, got themselves a little bit of a factory in an abandoned warehouse in Blackpool and began building sidecars that Walmsley had done before for reconditioned motorcycles. Now it wasn't until a bit later on that they decided to start building automobiles and let's get into that right now. In the late 1920s, Walmsley and Lyons decided that it was time to get into motor cars, automobiles or whatever you want to call them. But at the time, people didn't build cars and produce cars the way they do now. It's not like Volkswagen just pumping out a car finished. The way it would usually work is you would buy a chassis of a car that you wanted and then you would get a coach builder to build the uh, body on top of it. For example, Mulliners were a famous coach builder that are now owned by Rolls-Royce and some of the high-end Rolls-Royce and uh, previously the Bentleys would have the Mulliner logo on them and the reason for that is because Mulliner built the coach for it. So at this time, that was the way things were, and the two wanted to start building bodies for the Austin 7 chassis. Now unfortunately, you needed to be pre-approved to build an Austin 7 body, and you needed to be pre-approved by Austin themselves. Unfortunately, for such a small manufacturer such as the Swallow Sidecar Company, this would be almost impossible. So through a Blackpool agent that they had and they had met in Lancashire earlier that year, they got him to go to one of the dealers in Lancashire and take an Austin 7 chassis under the counter. Yes, this was the black market of auto building at the time. So they decided to build a two-seater sports car on top of this using a wood frame and some pressed steel. And what they came up with was the Austin Swallow uh, 7 and it was an immaculately incredible looking little sports car on this Austin 7 chassis. They then went to Austin themselves who loved it. They loved it so much they immediately approved it and these guys began distributing it. Now they were selling their Austin Swallow 7 for only £175 at the time. This meant that it was a very, very popular car, especially amongst those who didn't have much money. And this would run into the course of Jaguar's future DNA going forward. Uh, the reason for that is that Jaguar and William Lyons always wanted value for money and the Austin Se Swallow 7 was a perfect example of that at £175 for a two-seat sports car. Fortunately for them, when the Great Depression came as well, this meant that they kept on selling into the 30s and selling in bigger numbers than their competitors because of the price point. In 1928, things were going so well with their Austin Swallow 7 that they decided to move their factory to Coventry so they could be closer to the Leyland market and the big markets of the time. They were so confident in the cars they had built that in 1929, they first showed an SS1 Tourer at the London Motor Show. This was an incredibly big deal because only the biggest of car manufacturers were at the London Motor Show and now the Swallow Sidecar Company was with them. Now the SS1 
stood for Swallow Standard, actually, not Swallow Sidecar. The reason for this was in the 30s, they primarily moved all of their cars to what was called a standard company chassis. And the reason for that is the standard company had become quite a big name among chassis and engines, and you could get them reasonably priced and they were very reliable. So at the time, Swallow Sidecar Company started moving over to using standard engines, both a 2.5 and a or a 1.5 and a 2.5 liter engine. They then produced the SS 2.5 and 3.5 and 1.5 throughout the 30s, before 1935 when they introduced the SS Jaguar 100, an incredible two-seat sports car that just looked beautiful. It had the beautiful old round headlights and it just had this nice swooping uh, flow throughout it. This car sold incredibly well from 1935 up until 1939 when disaster hit as World War II kicked in and the company was prohibited from producing anything other than just engines and parts for the war effort. As such, the Swallow Sidecar Company could no longer sell its SS Tourers or its SS Jaguar until after the war. It's rumoured that during the war, William Lyons and William Haynes, his chief engineer, would sit up on the roof of their Coventry factory, overlooking the German bombing raids, um, and they would call this fire watching during the war, sitting on the roof and watching the planes come over bombing the area. Doesn't sound as much fun as maybe a fireworks display for 4th of July, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do at the time to get a bit of fun. The two started discussing building their own in-house chassis and their own in-house engines. And William Haynes had come up with the idea for the XK engine, a flat six, three liter or 3.5 liter motor that he wanted to develop. Of course, they were prohibited from doing this, but rumor has it that they had prototypes ready from 1943 and William Lyons wanted to get ahead of everyone else that would try and produce a car post-war. So by the time the war was over, in 1946, they already had an XK engine ready to go. This incredible flat six ran at 3.2 liters, 3.4 liters, and 3.8 liters different displacements that they had tried with various different setups of carburetors, Weber carbs, all that sort of thing. And this was an incredibly reliable, durable, and powerful engine. So in 1946, they had this engine ready but they also wanted to build their own car. And the production started on one of the most famous Jaguars of all time, the XK120, which was the 66001 in-house. Now I'll talk to you more about this in the another video, which I've already done. So if you wanna learn more about the XK120 and the history of that, watch it up there. Zoom forward to 1948, the XK120 was shown at the London Motor Show and caused a sensation. It was only ever supposed to be a prototype, but instead William Lyons decided to put it in production. And that year they made 242 of them and it put Jaguar on the sports car map. They were also making the Mark V with the XK engine at this point and they were now a luxury producer. Finally, the Daimler company had kind of come under their wing or gone bust, I can't remember exactly which, but essentially they had taken uh, hold of the Browns Lane production plant. Now this wasn't big enough to move all of their production over to, but in 1951 they started using that for the Mark I and eventually the Mark II. And now Jaguar had a full production line of fantastic cars ranging from the X K120, 140, 150 to the Mark I, the Mark II, and their large luxury vehicles such as the Mark V and later the Mark X, which the Craig brothers would use famously. And if you want to know more about the Mark II, you can click up here to the video I did yesterday. So Jaguar had a really, really good run after the war from 1946 to 1965. In between that time, they had released the E-Type Jag in 1961, which was incredibly popular. They had sold a ton of Mark IIs, and they were really, really booming. However, in the early 60s, there became a problem for them. So in 1965, Austin and Morris had joined forces to become the British Motor Company. They had also brought Press Steel, and this worried uh, uh, William Lyons because Press Steel Limited were his entire supplier of steel for all of their cars. So if the British Motor Company decided to stop supplying Jaguar, then overnight he would have to cease production. This along with the fact that he didn't have a son to pass the, the torch onto, if you will, 
made him think that maybe for the legacy of the company it would be best to sell it or merge it into something bigger. In July of 1965, William Lyons thus decided it was best to roll the company in and a merger was done between British Motor Company and Jaguar Group. This became the British Motors Holding Company, which included the Jaguar Group, Austin Morris. Now this group would get even bigger in 1968 when a merger was done between the British Motor Holding Company and the Leyland Group. So all of a sudden the Leyland Group which included things like Rover, Land Rover and other various companies which I've listed in the Drive Drive article if you want to read more about that, were all together in what became the British Leyland Motor Company. This was the biggest British holding company and produced thousands of cars a year and would go on to do quite well for a few years until poor decisions and poor quality caused the company to be prior or to be nationalized in 1975. Since its nationalization in 75, it did very, very, very poorly indeed. And if you want to read more about Leyland, I'll do something about that in the future. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about that. Luckily though, for the Leyland company and the Jaguar group as a whole, a nice uh, lady called Maggie Thatcher, or Margaret Thatcher if you want to give her a full name, would come into power in the 80s. And due to Cole Killen Thatcher's view of nationalisation and the fact that John Egan had come in and taken over the company as chairman, in 1984 Jaguar was privatised and floated on the stock market as a separate company. This was a big thing that Thatcher wanted to do. She wanted to move away from nationalisation and strain on public funding and also the fact that to be honest under Leyland's management the company was producing poor quality vehicles, spending too much money on whatnot. So Thatcher wanted to kill this off. So in 1984 the company became privatised once again under Sir John Egan's rule as chairman. Now he cleverly wrote off basically all of their debt into past vehicles and made it look like the government had taken all that. So essentially he swindled the government and who doesn't love someone who does that, especially if you own a Jag. In 1989, two incredible things happened. One was that I was born and if I wasn't born, you wouldn't be watching this video and your life would be slightly better. But let's move on from that. So in 1989, Ford Motor Company began buying up shares of the Jaguar Motor Group and by the 28th of February 1990 the Jaguar Motor Group was removed completely from the public stock exchange because Ford had essentially bought the majority stake in the company. Now between 1990 and 1999 Ford didn't really interfere too much with Jaguar. It decided to kind of let it run its course but it hadn't made a profit so far from its ownership and majority stake in the Jaguar uh, Group. So in 1999, it decided to bundle Jaguar in with a couple of its other purchases into something called the Premier Auto Group, and this was PAG. PAG included the Aston Martin Company, Land Rover and Jaguar. Now you're probably aware that Land Rover and Jaguar have been coupled together ever since, and the reason for this is that Ford made a big push on distributing these cars. It created an entire distribution network just to sell Land Rover and Jaguar worldwide, and this is why the two haven't really been split ever since. Now they produced on the Mondeo platform the X-Type and then they produced the S-Type. They put a lot of money into Jaguar, but between the years of 1999 to 2008, they also didn't make a profit. And then what happened in 2007 with the Great Recession, it was time to get rid of the group. Unfortunately, Jaguar was up in the air once again, being passed to someone new. Finally, in 2008, they had found a buyer after putting the company up for sale in 2007 and the unexpected buyer was the Tata Motor Group, who made the Tata car in India. And they would buy both Land Rover and Jaguar to call them Jaguar Land Rover together and that just gave them access to the entire distribution network worldwide. In 2009, they introduced the Jaguar XF which was a stunning car and ever since the Tata Motor Group has kind of brought Jaguar back to what it previously was which is kind of ironic that a country or a company from a country that Britain hold a, a, a let's start this again it's kind of interesting that a company from a country that Britain once owned now makes a better British car than Britain can today unfortunately Aston Martin got spooled off somewhere else to a, a billionaire 
Uh, but Jaguar Group has done quite well up until today. However, in past years, they've had a slight issue in terms of sales, and I imagine this coronavirus pandemic is probably not helping. But that's the Jaguar Group history up to today, and if you'd like to hear about specific Jaguar cars, please let me know in the comments, either on YouTube or on Drive Tribe, and I'd be delighted to make a video about them. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I really appreciate it, and as always, thank you again.